Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NESDIS Commercial Data Programs Community Day. We will be using the Adobe Connect platform. All of the attendees' microphones are muted. If you would like to submit a question for the question and answer session after the main presentation, please type your question in the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. The questions will be moderated. Without any further ado, it is time to introduce today's main speaker, Natalie Laudier. Natalie is the branch chief of the products mapping and piloting branch in Nesdis's systems architecture and engineering office. Natalie? Thanks, Dan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Natalie Laudier. I am the branch chief within systems architecture and engineering. And I will be taking um, as well the commercial data program as a, a commercial data program manager. Um, Trish Weir is actually moving on to another program. Um, so, so today we are going to talk about our NESDIS commercial um, commercial data program. Over, I'll give an overview of that, and then we will um, dig down deeper into our general request for information process. Um, first, Ed Grigsby, our Director of Systems Architecture and Engineering, will provide an overview of SAE and NESDIS um, in general from a higher level perspective. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. So thanks again for taking the, your time out of your day to spend with us. We really appreciate it and um, we're happy to be here. I just wanna uh, say again that if you have any questions, we'll be doing a question and answer session at the end of this um, presentation and you can enter those questions in the box um, at the bottom of your screen. So again, thanks, thanks for being here. And I will turn it over to Ed Grigsby. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, first, I, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody, and we're really glad that we uh, uh, have this participation from industry and uh, within NOAA, obviously. Um, <clears throat> this is a this is a really interesting day for us today. This is uh, this is our and part of our initiative to uh, provide as much transparency in the processes that we have within NOAA and NESDIS. And this is, of course, CDP. So um, our next generation architecture, um, is SAE, I'm the director of SAE. <clears throat> um, that next generation architecture is informed and complemented by many elements across uh, the globe, including uh, one of the most important aspects of the next generation architecture, our commercial partners. We cannot get to our aspirations without your innovation, creativity, and your, your work that provides a great foundation for uh, the hybrid systems of the future. Um, as you all know, um, we're looking at at a, a re, refitting, so to speak, of the LEO and the GEO and the SWO constellations. Um, LEO is in, in formulation right now. And part of that formulation activity is, is trying to determine exactly where commercial data lies in the hybrid systems of the future. So, <clears throat> shaping that next generation, new business models, commercial capability, as I just said. We have a ground system of the future, which is going to be a NESDIS ground enterprise capability. We have partnerships with other agencies and strategic partners, and I'll touch upon those in a second. And we have a very large initiative to engage with our users and understand how we benefit our nation and the world. Next slide. Okay. I think most of you, if you have been uh, around any of the uh, the administrator or associate administrator's presentations, uh, fully realize 
that our aspiration <clears throat> is to provide a truly integrated digital understanding of our Earth environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Earth is a system. And we've been working to understand that system and the phenomenon and the the geophysics of our system so that we can have a positive impact on society and the world. To do that, we have to have a global initiative. And NOAA and NESDES are part of a global initiative to make observations of the sun and the earth and all of its param <clears throat> physical parameters so that we know how to predict the next 20 years of what's going to happen to our earth. SAE within NESDIS is charged to help define the foundation of the observational systems, the requirements of those systems, the architecture of those systems, the observation characteristics. We manage the products, the services, the, we leverage data and technology through our commercial data and joint venture programs. And we're engaging with user community at every opportunity that we can. So I'm again, thanking you all for participating, for being innovative, for providing us your great capabilities to provide the nation and the world with a tremendous value from Noah and Nesdis. Natalie, back to you. Thanks. All right, <clears throat> now moving on to our commercial data program, also known as CDP. Uh, we really have a, an excellent team that supports CDP. Mark Crisparo and Jerry Peltzer will be, um, will be helping me on a panel for the question and answer session as well. But we do have the rest of the team online um, here as, as well today. So through our commercial data program, we're really able to utilize and get an early look at some of our new commercial um, data sources related to space-based environmental monitoring to support our NOAA missions. We have two main initiatives under our CDP. One is our commercial weather data pilot program where we can really get early your early looks at some of the new data that's available. Um, we're able to demonstrate the capability for operations and quality of the data and um, and the, the eventual goal is to transition that to operations. And then we have our commercial data purchase program where we're purchasing right now radio occultation data, which is going into our operational weather forecasts. This link below here is our commercial CDP um, website, and that's hosted on the Office of Space Commerce if you're interested in learning more about our program and some of our initiatives, um, please go to that link there. Now, we've been buying commercial radio occultation operationally since 2020. Um, these data go in um, to both models for neutral atmosphere as well as space weather. Um, we are also very interested in exploring our non-RO-based um, commercial data sources. And we recently, I'm excited to announce that we recently awarded a new microwave sounding pilot. These are some of our, our drivers and motivations for some of the decisions that we make um, within CDP. So some of the top ones are from Congress, from um, Department of Commerce, um, the bottom one, some of these documents we actually generate within SEA ourselves and including the objectives documents. Um, we also have an, a new NOAA commercial data by guidance, which is great because so our NESDIS commercial 
Data Office is not the only um, group that buys commercial data within NOAA. So it's good to have that standardized framework across, across NOAA and our organization. And that's actually up for public comment if you're interested in taking a look at it and providing feedback for it. So since the beginning of CDP, we've had a significant increase in our budget, um, except for the past few years where it's, it's leveled out a bit. Um, the interest level, which we're indicating by the blue line, and that's our, our request for information responses, um, that, that has grown significantly from, from industry. Um, and then in, in green, you can see the growth of the, the types of applications that we've been piloting. So that's, that's definitely been, been increasing as well. So the, our commercial RO purchases are, are extremely valuable to NOAA and to meet our, our NOAA and NESDIS mission. Um, these, these data are used in our, um, our numerical weather prediction models. Um, you can see on the right-hand side of the plot is our, is our commercial data, which is both um, UMATSAT and CDB purchases, and that's the amount of data that's actually assimilated into our, our weather models. And you can see it's almost about half. Um, I'm, I'm glad I get to also announce this, uh, this recent award for our delivery order number four um, that, that just started. And we're receiving data from Planet IQ as well as Spire of 3,000 radio occultations per day. And that's for a one year time period. So this topic uh, comes up quite a lot. Um, so NESDIS really, we do prefer the less restrict restricted data, right, um, data licensing. Um, for our operational purposes, we really want that unlimited distribution so we can share with all of our partners, with, with um, academia. Um, for our data pilots, it's a little more restrictive as, as we can handle that, but um, um, that's just for testing and analyzing the data during that pilot period. So what exactly is a commercial weather data pilot? Um, we will uh, partner with, um, with an industry partner and um, they'll, they'll be delivering us data for a certain amount of time and then we will also set up a government evaluation team where that team will conduct um, assessments and evaluations of the data. And then that team will also de deliver a final report and come up with recommendations of how to proceed. Um, we usually have three phases, which includes pre preparation phase, um, which is typically limited participation from, from the vendor while we're um, having in, um, engineering support to support our ingest and dissemination and data processing side um, on the NOAA side. And then, um, then we'll have the continuous delivery data, the da data delivery period where we're receiving continuous amounts of, of data. Um, and we'll, we'll have this evaluation period as well um, with also less, less support from the vendor. So these are two of our recent pilots. Our space weather pilot success, successfully concluded. Um, we were able to, po to um, release to the public final report. So that's now available online if you're interested in seeing that. Um, that was analyzing our GNSSRO for space applications. And then we still have our ongoing um, ocean surface winds pilot where we're looking at GNSS reflectometry data to derive ocean surface winds and additional measurements. Um, the plot to the right is actually an example of some of our derived ocean surface winds from commercial data.
this is what the government team looks at to um, evaluate our pilots. So when we stand up a, a government team of subject matter experts, they look at some different criteria. One is value and what what is the value of, of the data? Is it accurate? Are we getting it in a timely manner, a good latency? Is it reliable? Is it coming in when it's supposed to be coming in? Um, what is the use use of the data? Is, is it providing our impact to operations and meeting our mission? Um, can we are we able to assimilate that data? Can we can we actually bring it in and assimilate it into the models or into um, in, for in situ analysis? And then does it pass security? Um, and then what's the cost benefit? So what's our value added? Is the data actually available on orbit? And, and is it sustainable? Will it continue to be there and, and be on orbit and be available? For our overarching data um, pilot process, we have three main um, steps, which are market research, pilot planning and pilot execution. Um, for our market research, that's when we're in the RFI stage, we'll put out RFIs and other um, market research. We will, during pilot planning, we now like to release a draft statement of work for input from industry. So that's really helpful when, when um, industry can provide input on those, um, on those drafts that we release and we can get more information and then um, issue a request for proposals and then award as, as needed. Um, for the pilot execution, that's when we're um, planning for our data ingest, evaluation, standing up that government team again, and, um, and then have, have our final recommendation. This is our sample timeline of what we um, what we were able to accomplish after our general RFI was posted in December 2023. So after receiving all of our um, the feedback from our RFIs, our RFIs responses, we had to make the decision on what to pilot. So that was a decision point. And then we moved on to our acquisition process where we're putting out the solicitation. And, um, and by September, we just recently awarded our, our microwave sounder pilot. And then we'll start with pilot, start executing that pilot with the data delivery and evaluations. And then we have another decision point where we need to determine, are we ready for it to transition it to operations? Or do we need to go back and do another pilot to continue um, improving capabilities? Or are we going to um, put it on pause until we have some better, better technologies, better um, capabilities that will support our operations? This is the sample RFI that we, we posted in December, um, but basically it's um, any new capabilities that can address our space-based environmental monitoring um, mission and focusing on new and emerging technologies. So, well, after we received our um, our general RFI responses to that um, December um, 2023, we formed a capabilities assessment team, and this this was a team that reviewed all of the um, responses, and um, they initially prioritized those based on if it meets space-based environmental monitoring criteria as well as, is it data as a service? Um, they looked at different criteria. So is it meeting that mi a mission need in particular? Is it available now on orbit? And um, 
what's that path to to utilize the data? So can we assimilate it? Can we, um, how hard would it be to transition it? Um, we received a total of 24 RFI responses and then um, the team prioritized those 16 that were, were applicable. Um, the, the CAT team then refined the, the um, RFI priorities more, and we took a look at only the neutral atmosphere capabilities. We had a space weather pilot going on at the time, so um, we were not going to, to um, select another one. We, um, we also, the team also um, prioritized based on our um, priorities for no emissions. So the, re the recommendations out of our CAT team were microwave sounder, microwave radar, polar metric radi radio occultation, hyperspectral IR, and hyperspectral microwave. So these recommendations were, um, were presented and the decision um, were to award um, a microwave pilot as the top priority. Um, so we we were proceeding with the microwave sounding pilot because basically they it was it was easier to um, um, it was sorry it had the higher impact for our, our numerical weather prediction models. Um, we were able to leverage our NASA tropics mission expertise. Um, and we were we just awarded that to both tomorrow.io and orbital microsystems in September. Uh, we are also very interested in investigating hyperspectral microwave soundings. Um, we're leveraging the work from SAE joint venture and um, partnering with them on how we can um, do a, a pilot once um, uh, potentially do a pilot with um, hyperspe hyperspectral once it's on orbit and available. Um, we also would like to investigate polar metric RO. And um, this has been shown to be able to um, detect the characteristics of precipitation. So a new thing we did this year during our RFI evaluation process was also looking at different non-traditional ways of how we can partner with the, um, with the community. Um, so something other than data as a service, and we looked at diff the different responses and, and there were some really great, great ideas. Some of these were evaluating um, to be used in, in potential NESDIS um, architectures. So this really, this evaluation really did provide some great market research for us in some concept development. Uh, there were several public private partnership approaches um, they were some some suggestions about how the government would be an anchor tenant, uh, meaning the the um, primary customer. Uh, there were definitely some data licensing concerns that were noted by the vendors. Um, some of the recommendations moving forward was um, support for cloud processing and partnerships with with. Um, industry, uh, public-private partnerships in supplementing development of new capabilities to support our ob observations. So this is our overarching schedule for CDP. The top portion are our pilots, the bottom por portion are our purchases. Um, so right now we have this ongoing ocean surface winds contract and um, are in the evaluation stage. So um, pending results from our from that pilot, 
we are would like to um, follow on with a new ocean service winds pilot as well. Um, that's our the next one is our micro sounder uh, pilot, and that's going for one year. We plan to put out another GFRI um, later in or early springtime um, 2025, and and then um, a, a follow on um, pilot from that. We have for our purchases. We just recently ended delivery order three and are moving on to delivery order four for one year. We have an IDIQ on-ramping process, which will release in 2025 as well. Um, and that allows other, other vendors with radio occultation capabilities to, um, to propose for our um, IDIQ umbrella contract from which our, our delivery orders are under. And then we'll plan to um, begin and continue continuity with delivery order five in, in um, mid to late 2025. This is our organizational email for CDP. So um, not only if you have questions during this brief, but please, if you have questions later on after this talk or want to connect with us, please email um, our, our organizational email um, and or you can reach out to myself and Susanna, who's our contracting officer. Um, again, that's our, our web page, um, our CDP web page, if you would like some more information too. Um, and that, that concludes my part of the talk. I think we'll move on to our questions and answers phase. So if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. And Marcus Sparrow and Jerry Peltzer will be on our panel to help um, answer questions. Okay, great. Um, so far, just one question, and it is a general question about whether or not uh, this presentation will be shared afterwards and recorded. And the answer is yes, uh, we will share that presentation uh, afterwards and um, you will see that posted shortly. And um, from what I understand, it will be recorded as well. Okay, so here's a question, Natalie. Um, are you interested in only low earth orbit solutions? Um, that's a great question. Um, I will pass that to Mark to answer. So um, right now that has been the focus. Um, when we sent out the general RFI last fall, we were looking at all opportunities do you also include geospatial orbits as well? Um, so yes, we are looking at all available technologies, but we found that the vast, vast majority of the commercial providers are heavily into the commercial um, low Earth orbit platform. Okay, so now question here is, um, and I'm going to pitch this one over to you, Jerry. Will you be accepting new vendors for the follow-on ocean surface winds pilot and what requirements would you expect for new vendors? All right, let me uh, look at this real quick here. We'll be accepting new vendors for the follow-on oceans. Uh, oh, Jerry, you, you went off mute. Yes, of course. We do. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we'd definitely be looking for uh, new vendors for the follow on ocean surface winds pilot. It'll be an open bid as, as the first ocean surface winds pilot was. Um, we're looking for uh, vendors uh, interested in participating and uh, potentially more than one vendor in this case for the follow on pilot. So, uh, uh, requirement for new vendors would be the same as. Um, as was before, one of the key requirements would be that you have a space-based capability in orbit, um, and that uh, capability is is firmly in orbit and producing data. 
um, as of the time of the submission of your proposal. Uh, that's, that's really the key requirement. Another requirement that we want to look at is your ability to do new, near nadir um, GNSS reflectometry uh, in order for us to work on deriving ocean surface wind measurements. Um, also, uh, we're looking at ancillary applications as well, uh, things like soil moisture, uh, inundation, sea ice, ice characterization, and, and a whole host of others. So uh, we're, we're interested in all those capabilities. And, um, and so if, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to post more. Thanks. Okay, here's a question. And uh, for you, Natalie, sounds like NOAA got some good feedback or recommendations in the last GRFI, which we did. Um, are there any plans to implement some changes based on that feedback? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so we, I think we have made some changes, um, some in, in our acquisition schedules. We expanded um, our, our um, uh, timelines a little bit, um, but yes, we're still still evaluating them. We are conducting an analysis of alternatives for radio occultation right now, um, which is also taking in some of that feedback as well um, to implement some of the some changes in the future. Okay, great. Um, the other one is, is there available list of prioritized technology sought for FY25 and beyond? Yeah, um, for prioritized technologies that we're looking for, we don't have um, a specific prioritized list. Um, it's really, it's based on our, our CAT teams that we stand up and our evaluation process where we're weighing what's available versus what are our, our needs for, for NOAA and filling gaps, improving our, our models, our weather models, our weather forecasting, um, so that we don't ha necessarily have a specific technology that we believe will, will help um, in, in particular um, in a prioritized manner. Okay, um, another question is in regard to multi-year contracts, um, the ability to award multi-year contracts. Um, so we so we do have our IDIQ, which is a five-year span. Um, so under that, we're able to award um, our delivery orders. So that is our um, multiple year. We are We are looking into some other options how we can expedite things, um, how we can improve things. So um, we're working with our contracting office to do that. Okay. All right. I, and I realized there was a related question on there about, um, it, you know, I, I know we hear this a lot from commercial industry about uh, longer term contracts regarding the sustainability um, to allow more financial stability of the, on the commercial side. Uh, so I guess that, that goes along with the same question about having longer term contracts as a possibility. Yeah, unfortunately it's hard to predict our future budgets as well. Um, it, it depends on, on Congress and um, we don't have a great outlook of our, our future future years. Okay, um, so here's a question, and I'm actually going to answer this one here. This is, um, someone asked a question about geo uh, hyperspectral sounding, and, and really they, it's, it's, it's the general question of the desire primarily for level 1B or 1 data versus higher order products. And, and the answer is, is to that is no one prefers the lower order product, level 0, level 1 data. Um, and that is because we need that data in order to uh, properly assimilate that into numerical weather prediction models. Um, with level two and beyond, I, I realize other agencies like the Department of Defense are okay with that, but, but NOAA does a lot of um, hands-on assimilations and developing forward operators for different technologies. And that's why we prefer the lower end uh, products of zero and one. Okay. Um, 
let's see here. Next question. All right, here's a good one. Is there a target timeline for successful piloting of technology into operations, transition to operations? And along those lines, what is the expected gap between the end of a pilot and onerating into operation? I could take a, take a stab at that. Okay. Um, I'd like to say that that varies significantly from technology to technology. So there's a couple things at play here. There is uh, NOAA's own internal development, uh, their ability to assimilate the data into weather models, for example, their do ability to produce. Jerry, you, you, you went on off mute again. Uh, Can you hear me, Mark? I, I can, I can hear you. Okay. So uh, let me repeat. Um, there are um, two aspects to this. The first aspect is it varies from technology to technology. So uh, I would say for example, um, with the technology uh, that we're looking at, um, there's a question of whether NOAA is able to assimilate this data, um, whether we have done research to uh, check the viability of this data, and uh, what's the, the current status of our understanding, the knowledge of, of this data. And on the vendor side, it's, it's whether the vendor has the mature capability in orbit in order to provide operational um, observations. So it's, it's kind of a combination of things. Um, when we have a target timeline, if you look at RO, it was several years of pilots before that was ready for operational use. And um, I think with a technology like ocean surface winds, there's at least another year of piloting available before we consider an operational use. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Um, here's a question. Does the five-year IDIQ allow a full five-year commitment? Or does it just lock in pricing if NOAA renews annually for four years after the first? Um, for IDIQs, um, when NOAA enters in into an IDAQ, the way IDAQs work is people that are on the IDAQ get exclusive uh, access to bidding on a contract unless other vendors come on in. Um, it does not lock in pricing, and each delivery order of that particular IDAQ is priced separately. Um, and it would not does not automatically renew. Um, I did, that also depends upon our current IDAQ does not automatically renew each one is bid separately. Uh, for other IDAQs, that would really depend upon how the contract is structured to begin with. All right. So, um, what are some of the lessons learned? Successes and biggest challenges identified with respect to integrating commercial data alongside other sources of NOAA models. Um, I, I haven't been here that long, but I know how challenging it can be to integrate um, data into the weather models and transition things to operations. Um, but yeah, I think it's really just, it's the the manpower, the resources on on NOAA side as well. Um, is, are they, are they, do they have the capability, the technology? Do we, are we proving that it's, um, there's value added? Um, so we need, we have to do a, a pretty extensive analysis and, um, and a capability delivery for assimilation. Um, it might not be necessarily assimilation, but we also need to make sure if it's not assimilating, then we need to prove our value added if it's um, an in-situ capability. All right, I'd like to also add that um, there is definitely some positives with having commercial vendors. There's a, allows for a much greater flexibility than having your traditional pay-to-build satellite um, where those requirements are locked in place earlier. 
It allows much more greater flexibility to you know, change the requirements from contract to contract. Um, contractors are, are able to um, ramp up and scale up more effectively than, than the government. Um, but it, there are obviously um, challenges with the different kinds of platforms that different different vendors have. So um, I, I, I would like to add on that um, we see unique challenges from vendor to vendor, and we do a, we try to do a good job vetting what goes on on contract beforehand. And and we as the government like to work with any vendor and any unique challenges that potentially happens. Um, and I think we've done a good job. Um, so we have one here regarding um, sharing of data. And is there a hard requirement such as an international agreement that data must be shared if purchased from a commercial service? Um, if, you, if you want me, uh, I, can, I can help answer that one. Um, our data rights depend upon what we put on each contract. So we have the flexibility, uh, depending upon what is directed, uh, what we decide, working with our contracting folks over in the um, AGO or Acquisition Grants Office at NOAA to determine what the data rights uh, are going to be for each particular contract. Um, so it changes from contract to contract, but the preferred method for an operational contract is unlimited data. And that gives everyone the ability to, to um, have access to that data. And it's also in, 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 in line with um, WMO Resolution 1, the Unified Data Share Plans. Uh, for pilots, it's a little bit more restricted since that's not operational. I hope that answers that question. I know I saw a few folks comment on it. I'm just scrolling through the questions here. Okay, so would you consider integrating any new technologies evaluated under CDP into the GOXO program? That is one I do not have an answer for. I don't know if, if, if you do, Natalie. Um, possibly some of the new capabilities that we were evaluating um, could potentially go on, on GEO. Um, I think it's more of a, um, it, that would be more of a, a piloting effort that we're, that we are doing now that could help support that, that program later. Um, so it would be more of initial, initial evaluations. Okay, so here is a cost budget question. Um, does the commercial data program budget cover any other costs of CDP besides just the data buys for, for uh, pilots and operational purposes? Yes, so we do, um, other than um, funding our commercial companies for data buys and Pilot purchases, we also fund internally to NOAA and NESDIS. We fund our research community, we are our researchers to evaluate the data for us. So that government evaluation I described, um, we're the ones funding that to do that. Um, we, we look at um, our data assimilation teams and we provide them funding as well to, um, so as we as we're going along, in these pilot from the very beginning, we have that operational viewpoint um, evaluating the data and, and they're, they're assessing how they can assimilate the data early on. So that way it'll be easier to transition it to operations when we do decide to do that. And that way we can also determine the value added um, into, the, into the models. Speaking of that, and this is a little bit related to an earlier question, but regarding transition to operations, once a technology is evaluated positively in a pilot, what is the strategy to integrate into NOAA operations? Yeah, I kind of just answered that because we, 
we work with the operational community from the very beginning of a pilot. We're, um, we're funding the simulation teams to look at it. We're, we're funding them to, um, to look at the value added as well of the new, new data into, into our models. Thank you. Um, I think that it covers the majority of questions. There are a lot of re some repeats in there, so we lump them together. Um, we have a few more minutes. Okay, it is one forty-five. Um, do have a question in there um who at noaa should we work with to understand uh, noaa's cloud delivery requirements file formats security hosting um i know that is done through a different office that's the office of common services they have what we call the nesdisk online cloud framework or nccf um, so we do have, um, documentation that, um, when someone goes on contract that we share out and, and, and there are requirements in place. Um, some of those documents are restricted to the government. So we will, um, if we can, we would, we, 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 we can share them, but uh, a lot of times, um, a lot of times we can't due to security reasons, but um there are things that we can do to share out um with with vendors um i also know that when we put out a statement to of work we have security requirements listed into the um in there as well as a, as a provision uh, but if people want more information on that um we do have folks over over in the uh, uh, ocs side that can, that can better answer that yeah, please feel free to reach out to our, our functional CDP email. We can get you some more information. Okay. So I, somebody had mentioned this in, in, the, in the questions here, and this isn't quite correct. Um, we, our mission at, our core mission at NESDA CDP, I just want to reiterate, is to purchase data um, from vendors that have um assets on orbit so we are interested in a, a data as a service model so we purchase data commercially owned commercially operated satellites uh, we pilot that data and with the end goal of procuring that data for an operational purchase in the future so that is our core function here um, so um yeah, I think the confusion with that question might have been um, for the public-private partnership Correct. Um, analysis that we also did on top of the data as a service analysis of the RFI responses. Correct, and that was a little non-traditional. Uh, that was something that was done on the side to look at other avenues as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, if DOD such as Air Force, contributes funding to NOAA to buy commercial data, will that drive a change in the preferred data rights model? So no, we will keep our same um, licensing, pre licensing preferences, um, which is the, the unrestricted dissemination, if, um, if anyone contributes. Okay, um, we have a question here that I think would be better answered just by reading it uh, from the Office of Space Commerce, not so much us, but it talks about the Department of Commerce license capabilities, specifically commercial remote sensing licenses. Who would be the procuring entity for environmental, weather, and climate data observations? don't have a good question for that 
Um, but I, the Office of Space and Commerce points to contact. It's the first thing that I could think of that it would be a, um, someone to go to. Unless Jerry or Natalie, you have any other comments on that? Yeah, I think that's right. Office of the Space Commerce. Yeah, I'd agree with that. We would be the one carrying the observations. I want to clarify, um, but the Office of Space Commerce handles um, a lot more when it regards to remote sensing licenses. Don't know if I answered. We answered that question completely or not, so I apologize if not. But uh, you can always reach out to us afterwards. We have the um, the emails that uh, Natalie put up in the end, and. It is 1.51, so we have nine minutes left. If anyone else wants to ask any questions, just put that in the Q&A box, please. So somebody asked if we're planning an in-person industry day in November, like last year. Um, the answer is no. We are not going to do that this year. Mark, we have an ionospheric question. You want to answer that one? Yes, let's scroll up here. Um, we do have a clarification to something I said earlier. Um, so um, in, in regard to the question regarding licensing, it, I, I stand corrected. It is not the Office of Space Commerce. It is the Commercial Remote Sensing Regulatory Affairs Office. So I, I, I stand corrected on that. So please, if anybody has any questions on commercial remote sensing licensing, that is the office to go to. Again, that's the Commercial Remote Sensing Regulatory Affairs. I do apologize. It's not an area of, of our number one expertise. Um, so regarding the um, RO, um, So the question here, and I, I apologize, I'm reading small font. Um, we do purchase uh, right now neutral atmospheric RO profiles through the commercial data buy. Um, as part of that, we get total electronic content. Now the total electronic content that we get is meeting the same latency requirements, 140 minutes um, for delivery. Um, that, that total electronic content profile comes with the neutral atmosphere profiles. In order for us to use it, or more accurately, for the Space Weather Prediction Center to use it operationally and to what we call the global TEC model, um, they require 30 minutes or less. So um, that would be an option as part of our IDIQ to purchase. We, we have not uh, pulled the trigger on that yet. And uh, that was something we looked at with the space weather data pilot. Um, so let's see here. And yes, it, it, it the, the, the ionospheric parameters that we measured, total electron content, incineration, phase and amplitude are all come from the same um, um, same RO sensor. It's just the RO sensor has different abilities on there. So you're looking at the uh, pseudo range, you're looking at signal to noise ratio, and you're looking at phase, especially phase differential, um, or should I say excess phase. And from there, that's where we would uh, obtain ionospheric measurements. Okay, 
Um, so somebody asked um, why we only purchased 3,000 radio occultation profiles. Is that due to budget limitations or technical issues? So that was based on, our decision for that was based on our budget at the time, as well as our, our requirements that we received from um, National Weather Service. Correct. And, and I will also add that um, when we received the proposals um, in, at the particular time, that was also the capability that um, that was available on the plane before Transporter 11, and that launch was delayed. So we 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 recognize that now. Um, we cannot comment any further about what a, a future delivery order would look like. Okay, and this is the last question I see here. If we responded to the 2023 RFI solicitation, should we also respond to a 24 or 25 RFI, um, even if that capability is the same? I would recommend that you do, um, just so we have, we, we know that there's no other updates um, or capabilities from you. Right, and the, as Natalie mentioned, it look, we are going to be submitting a new R, RFI request in early 2025. Um, and we encourage all vendors to provide their inputs, even if it's the same, um, even slight technical details could matter. So um, that, that's always good to respond. Okay, so Natalie, it is 157. Okay, um, I wanted to mention to everybody that we will be posting today's presentation and the recording on SAM.gov. Um, we'll be emailing those that registered registered for this event um, once it's posted. So um, yeah, I think that's the last of the questions, but we really appreciate you spending some time with us today and um, hearing about some of our updates for CDP and our general RFI process. So um, thanks again for being here and thanks for CDP team. Thanks to the tech team and comms team for putting this all together um, with minimal bugs. So really appreciate everybody. Thank you.